they just like and then you just like chop off pieces and they grab more it's really fun okay so Did you all see where I uploaded um, the recording from class? Okay, so I'm gonna try to do that every every class day, but I don't recommend actually for y'all to re-watch lecture. And um, that's really more if there's uh, some kind of event and you can't come to class and you need to see lecture for the first time. And then if there's like one topic that you're confused on and you want to go back and watch me talk about it again, but because you're in such a condensed schedule, you don't really have time to watch two two hour lectures every day. So it's better to use that like just kind of as a if you miss class or like to check yourself. Okay, I wanted to also upload. I wanted to upload the calendar because I think some people are kind of panicking because we um, we didn't cover as much, but that calendar is really more my um, most of my ideal. And I don't, I never really expected us to actually meet the ideal. It's just like the hope. So I do ad adjust the calendar as we go through. So I'm going to kind of show you what I do for that. But I, I just didn't realize what time it was because I was having so much fun in office hours. For those of you who went to office hours, did you learn a lot? Yes, there was more than just one person there. Would you recommend your peers to also go to office hours? Yes, excellent. Also, I think I talked about the CRC as an option for tutoring. One of my students last semester told me that you can go through um, UNT and they actually have um, free tutoring that you can get at UNT, like free one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, so look that up through the tutoring center. I don't remember what app she told me she, there's like a UNT app that kind of like helps you, um, helps you do that. So I recommend that if you need help. Um, for those of you who have ODA accommodations and you've emailed me and I haven't emailed you back, I will do that today. But if we can't get your accommodations set up this week, because it's the very first week of class um, and it's hard to get your meeting time in with them, if you uh, come to me or email me if you haven't already, we'll give you that extra time that the ODA grants you. Um, you can just come to my office. I'll make a quiet environment for you to sit and take your quiz. Um, or even your exam, I can only offer that this first week. I can't really go beyond that. It has to go through the ODA beyond that. But because we're on such a tight schedule, if you haven't gotten those accommodations yet, especially for those students who I know transferred in from another university and they've never worked with the ODA before, um, we can get you that just for this first week. So reach out to me if that uh, if that's you. Okay, so what we had, what we had on the calendar was this chapter one and two, but all we got to was chapter one, right? So instead, I'll move everything back. We're going to finish one and two this morning, get to chapter two, and then quiz one will just be uh, over one and three. And we'll do chapter three after our quiz on Thursday or on Wednesday, and then some also on Friday. We probably won't get to chapter four. Um, so this is more of a realistic schedule for us. I'm still going to have you work on your homework for chapter one through three, but if we don't finish chapter three completely, just only do up to what we've covered in class, turn that in, and the exam will only cover up to what we've covered in class. So I'll never make you take a quiz or an exam over something that I haven't covered in class yet. So I wanted to go over that with you. Um, and then I also wanted to show you. 
since all of you are, had a lot of questions about the quiz, I went ahead and showed um, my quiz from last semester. So I changed the questions, obviously. I wouldn't just like give you the exact same quiz, right? But um, I changed the questions, but it will be very similar in format. So there will be a question where you have to draw the condensed structures, uh, or from the condensed structures, draw the bond line. This one I made multiple choice, but you will have a resonance structure question. And you'll have to identify, identify functional groups. And then you'll have to identify if an overall molecule is polar or nonpolar, and then like if individual bonds are polar or nonpolar. And we'll cover, we should cover all of this in class today. If we don't, I'll modify the quiz to reflect that. Um, I changed the bonus question because we're only going to really lightly touch on spectroscopy because that doesn't come up as much in this chapter. Um, especially if Dr. Bearhead's teaching OCHEM too. So I'm just gonna explain the basics to you and the bonus question will be slightly different. And I try to always have a bonus question in there just in case, you know? So the structure of the quiz will be very similar to this, but it's not the same molecule. So these are the concepts I want you to know, but don't just memorize this and think you're gonna get away with it because that won't work. Okay. So I wanted to show you that. And there is, there won't always be this, but there is a video key for um, that quiz as well. I just happened to have made one. So if you want to watch me work out that quiz and like explain what I what I did, you can literally watch me do that. And then also, um, where some people asked in their survey for extra practice problems. If you want extra practice problems. Um, in my OCHEM 1 practice problem uh, playlist, I have those practice problem videos that go with your chapter homework, but I also have, if you scroll down, um, old recitations. So you can also use um, those old recitations as well to look through um, and get practice problems that way. And then I have a whole quizzes and tests playlist where you can see, so like that was quiz one, here's quiz two, uh, here was my first exam. So I'm not trying to hide what you can expect on your quizzes and exams. And uh, they'll be slightly different, but similar concepts. So there's a lot of practice problems that you already have access to on those videos. And again, I recommend if you if you like looking at an old video and you don't have the worksheet, like for your practice problems, I want you to try it yourself and then watch the video, right? Well, on the video, you don't have those worksheets necessarily. So I would pause it read the question, work it yourself, and then play me working that question so that you um, get the practice in yourself first. Like always try the question first before. Um, so I think that's everything. Someone asked me today about um, how to turn in your homework. If you go to assignments, under assignments, there's homework chapter one dash three. And then you, there will be a button for you where you just hit start assignment and then you just upload your document. So all I want to see is that you've worked those practice problems. I don't care what answer you got because I already did them for you. <laughs> I want to see that you did the work um, and I'll just like spot grade. So I'll just be like, okay, I'm going to check if everybody did 5, 10, and 12. And I'll just like look at 5, 10, and 12. And if you did those ones, I won't tell you ahead of time what they'll be. So and um, you want to do as many as you can um, and, and show that you did that work. Okay, I think that's it for administrative details. Do you guys have any other questions? Yes. No, I don't think I have a preferred format. There's like a, yeah, iPad knows anything. There's like a speed reader that I could just click through and look at your submission and um, like scroll through. And I don't think I even have to download it unless there might be one file type that has to download, but I can just, it's pretty easy for me to grade those uploaded things. So I wanna make it as easy as possible for y'all. So whatever is the easiest thing. If you like iPad notes, upload it that way. If you like handwritten notes and you they have those like genius scan apps that will turn them into PDFs, you could do that. Or you could just take pictures and put them in a Word document and send me that, I don't care. Whatever is easiest for you, that's what I wanna see. Or if you really want to just do it on paper and you don't have good technology, you can finish it by Thursday at the end of class and just hand it to me. But paper is not the best, I think, because it gets lost. Any other questions? 
Okay, great. Well, of course, if you have any, let me know. So for the first, I think what I'm gonna do is we're not gonna take a class break today. I'm gonna try to get all the way to um, through the end of chapter two, and then we'll have a small break before we start the recitation portion. You need to go pick up your recitation packets, and then y'all will get into groups with people around you, and I'll um, assign you into groups. And I have a cup system that I'm trying out for the first time this semester, so y'all be my guinea pig. And, but what I want y'all to do with these cups, I'll explain later, later, but it's basically like, if you don't need any help, if you need a quick little bit of help, or if you need me to like sit down and really go through something with you, that's what these are for, because there's only one of me and there's probably gonna be like 10 to 14 groups, so. Okay, great. Let's get into our chapter one notes. Did any of you look at the old notes for chapter two? Did you see how terrible they were? I'd actually fixed half of those already. So that was like already with that group. Oh, I don't like how I was doing this shadow thing here. Let's see. Okay. We had just gotten into, ah, uh, yes, bond line formula. And someone actually today in office hours gave me a great trick. So, um, this is the notation that I say that organic chemists use because we're lazy and we don't want to draw in one gazillion hydrogens. Um, but also just because organic molecules can get really complicated. And so drawing in all those hydrogens would make it almost impossible to read. Um, but essentially the formula that organic chemists use is um, called bond line formula. And something that's really important as we're going through organic chemistry is always before you've kind of just like seen atoms and molecules as like words on a page, right? Like uh, NH3 or NaCl or whatever. With organic chemistry, you're going to have to really think about the shape of the molecules. Oh man, I left my giant water bottle upstairs. That's a bummer. Okay. You're going to have to really think about the shapes of the molecules and able to be effectively able to predict the movement of electrons. And so we want you to get really good at being able to kind of go through and convert from one representation of the molecule to another. That's one of the big goals for organic chemistry. And that uh, idea is called represent representational competence. Are you able to understand several different representations in organic chemistry? So this is the ball stick model. It's sort of good because it's 3D, but it's not great because it doesn't really show you the shape of the orbitals or how like the electrons are kind of in a cloud and they're always moving. Um, the electron dot formula, I think I mentioned biochemists tend to use that more. Um, dash formula is basically low structure. I don't know why they call it dash formula, it bugs me. Um, and then condensed formula, I think is really useful because it helps kind of give clues about what the Lewis structure might look like. And then bond line formula is the formula that organic chemists use. So uh, what bond line formula is, is I like to say bends and ends represent a carbon. So if you have a structure like CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, there are four carbons in that. And actually someone today in office hours told me that they do it by drawing a dot for every um, carbon. You don't have to do that, but kind of to help you know that there are four carbons here. And then the bonds connect. So that represents that there's one, two, three, four carbons there, right? Um, you don't have to draw the dots. I usually just draw it out like that. But I usually do go back and number if I'm ever not sure to make sure that there are four carbons, you'll see me count up a lot. I'll be like, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, you know, so I, that I make sure I have the right number. And our assumption here, because there's no negative or positive, is that each carbon has a, a neutral formal charge. So how many bonds does carbon need to have to have a neutral formal charge? Four. So carbon starts with four valence electrons based on the um, group it's in, not the number on the top, but four valence electrons. And if it has no lone pairs, then it needs four bonds to be zero. So we assume that there are four bonds that are hydrogens that are filling in each of this position. So 
This had only one bond to carbon, so we put three hydrogens. This had only this had two bonds to carbon, so we only need two hydrogens. This has two bonds to carbon, so we only need two hydrogens. And this has only one bond to carbon, so we need three. So that's kind of the basics of bond line formula. You'll need to be able to go from condensed structure to bond line, and then from bond line back to condensed formula. And you'll notice that typically, if it's just a plain straight hydrocarbon, so just carbon with only hydrogens, it'll be CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. Sometimes there are double and triple bonds, and that changes the number of hydrogens around it. So you have something like this. What would be the condensed formula? How many hydrogens are on that first one? Three. three. So that would be CH3. How many hydrogens are here? Two. So that would be CH2. How many hydrogens need to be here to get up to four? You only need one because there's already three bonds. One, two, three, four. So that would just be CH. And then what about here? How many hydrogens do we need? Two. Because you already have one, two bonds. So if you are perhaps on a quiz and you perhaps see a deviation from your standard CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, that's a hint that there's a, perhaps a double or maybe even a triple bond present in your molecule. So that's what I mean about condensed formula kind of having hints towards the structure is condensed formula tells us what the structure is going to be like. Um, if there is ever what's called a heteroatom, so not a carbon or a hydrogen, that will be explicitly drawn out. And sorry, that's a bad bond, but it goes right at that carbon. Um, and if there's any hydrogens attached to the heteroatom, those do have to be drawn. So implied hydrogens are only present on carbon. So the condensed formula for this molecule would be CH3, CH, and sometimes they'll put these in parentheses if it still goes right there and it goes together, like OH is together. So we put it in parentheses and then CH2 and then CH3. If you had bromine, because it's only one atom, you wouldn't have to put it in parentheses. So this would be CH3, CHBr. So you have one H and one Br on that carbon. CH2, CH3. So we typically use parentheses to indicate like these two molecules go together off of the carbon. Yes. I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. One more time. Uh, it sort of depends. If I'm explicitly asking about that, yeah, go ahead and draw them in. If you're just doing it for um, like a quick notation, they're not always drawn in. So there's not really a hard and fast rule, but you should know this is kind of where formal charge gets hard. I think the basics of formal charge people can track with, but um, there's something that I like to call like hidden electrons that you have to use the formal charge to imply. So this is a neutral bromine. So it must have seven things around it, bonds and or electrons or some combination of it. We only have one drawn in, but since it's neutral, you go ahead and assume that there are six electrons around it. So that's like a hidden, hidden, for, hidden electrons that you imply from the formal charge. Or the same thing with this oxygen. This oxygen um, doesn't have any electrons drawn around it, but oxygen needs six things around it because it starts with six valence. Uh, electrons, so you assume that there's two lone pairs around it. So that was a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, they're just not always drawn in, but you have to use your knowledge of formal charge to assume them in, which that is, I think, one of the hardest things about formal charge. One is um, implied hydrogens coming into play with formal charge can be hard. And then knowing that there are electrons there, even though I don't tell you that they're there because the formal charge is neutral, so you can assume that they're there. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about bond line formula. I'm going to take you through it again through the notes. I just like to kind of get it get through it twice with you. So we have the ball and stick model structure. And what I want you to see 
is how that ball and stick goes up and down. Because it's in that tetrahedral shape, the carbon molecules form that up, down, up, down, up, down. That's why we draw it with the bends like that, is we're literally trying to represent the tetrahedral shape. So at each up, there's two hydrogens. At each down, there's two hydrogens. Up, two hydrogens pointing up, down, two hydrogens pointing down. So we try to represent the actual 3D shape of the molecule when we're doing it flat on the page. Um, so this you can do on your own as kind of practice questions to see how uh, to go back and forth if you're able to go back and forth from the condensed to the bond line. So each line is a bond, each bend or end is a carbon atom. No carbon or C is ever written out in these cases. The only time you'll see it is maybe if it's a triple bond and people are doing it for clarity, but it's never required. So those angles are the carbons and those lines are the bonds. You always assume a neutral formal charge unless it's otherwise stated or if the question is asking you to find the formal charge. So if I'm saying, what's the formal charge on this atom? Don't assume it's neutral, only when it's not a formal charge question. Um, so there has to be four bonds around carbon to get to that neutral charge. And unless it's otherwise noted with a specific heteroatom, those are filled in with hydrogen. Um, and no H is shown unless sometimes it's needed for 3D perspective. And we sort of talked about those wedges and dashes a little bit. And I think we're going to come back around to that later in this chapter. Um, or if it's specifically attached to a heteroatom. So you can see when we draw these out, there's no hydrogens attached. And um, if a heteroatom, so anything that's not carbon or hydrogen is a heteroatom, the most common ones are the ones we talked about yesterday in class. Sulfurs, oxygens, fluorines, chlorines, bromine, iodine, and nitrogen are kind of the main ones that we'll see. Yeah, those are the only ones I can think of off the top of my head. It will always be drawn in, and the hydrogens off of a heteroatom always have to be drawn. Okay, so I want us to do a practice problem break um, where you practice going from, and you can talk to your peers about this. I want you to practice doing bond line formula. So I'm going to draw a condensed structure. Oh, wait. I did this. That should be CH. Sorry. I'm getting that this way. So I want you to draw the bond line structure of that. And then I want you to write the condensed formula of. And I really cannot talk for an hour. So normally I'd walk around while you guys do that, but I'm going to run upstairs and get my water bottle because otherwise I'll die if I don't drink water and talk for an hour. Oh, okay, normally I like to walk around and sort of see how you guys are doing during practice problems, but in this case, I was desperate. Are y'all ready to do it together? Yes. Awesome. 
should be C H three. <laughs> Makes more sense. Sorry. I'll give you maybe like thirty more seconds. Sorry, I confused you on that. That's good. Even though it's not a mistake, you caught it. But just you understand. Yeah. All right, so for this bond line formula, there's, I'm going to do the backbone first. So CH3, CH, CH2, CH3. So that's four carbons. This one would have three hydrogens around it. So that's right. This one would have a hydrogen and a CH3 group off of it. And you just draw that as a straight line up. So that's also a CH3 right here, right? And then CH2 and CH3. Does that make sense? Did most of you get that? Great. Yes. You can do it for practice. Like if on your quiz tomorrow, there'll be questions like this. If you want to write in those, you can do that. But for the actual answer, I want you to draw it like this. Um, but if you have this work and then this, that will bother me. You can definitely do that first, but you need to get all the way to the bottom line formula. And sometimes what people will do um, that I don't recommend is they'll be like, there's a hydrogen here, 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 here. And the reason why I don't recommend just drawing a line like that is because now this looks like you've added three methyl groups here, three methyl groups here, three methyl groups here, and that significantly changes the molecule. But also, then students will accidentally count those as carbons when they meant them as lines to indicate hydrogens. So I would either draw in the hydrogens or don't do anything at all. But don't just draw like a dashed line. Um, even dots, those can represent radicals. So that can confuse people, although it confuses them less. Um, but I really recommend you actually write the hydrogens or don't write them at all. But I don't recommend doing like a little thing in between because it can confuse people. Okay, and then the condensed formula for this one, CH3, what's this? CH, and then I'll just put the CL after, and what's this? CH, and what's this? Nice, you guys got it. We don't have to do too much of this anymore. Um, okay, um, so here's just more examples of bond line formulas if you wanna practice, and then also giving you that visual representation in the ball and stick model form. So you can see why we draw the things the way we do with the lines up and down. And you can sort of see the hydrogens coming towards you. Um, and then again, just more representations. You can do these as practice problems. Like these are just examples that I left in here. But if you want practice problems, these are good practice problems. And having the ball and stick model next to it helps you see what's kind of actually going on. Typically black atoms are carbon. White atoms are hydrogen, and hetero atoms have their own special colors, but red is usually oxygen. And then um, nitrogens are blue, and chlorine, actually, all halogens usually end up being green. So, like, even in my modeling kit, like, that's a halogen, that's a hydrogen with two carbons. They kind of keep those consistent among modeling kits, kind of the consensus. Okay, but sometimes we have to represent 3D molecules on a page and the bond line formula doesn't just do it. One thing that we'll get into as we do more organic chemistry is when things are 3D structured, they can be left and right handed, right? I have a left and right hand, they're different. My gloves for my left and right hand don't fit each other. And sometimes there are molecules that are left and right handed. So we have to be able to show their 3D arrangement so that we can find the left and right handedness of the molecules. So it's really important for us to be able to show 3D shapes. So I'm going to bring you all the way back to Vesper theory. And do you remember what the shape of something with four molecules or four bonds around it is called? Tetrahedral. tetrahedral. That's right. So tetrahedral is where we will live and breathe in organic chemistry because carbons, natural shape, unless they're in a double or triple bond, are tetrahedral. So we do a lot of tetrahedral things in organic chemistry. Um, 
So you got to get used to that. But the nice thing is you don't have to do anything above that in Vesper theory, right? You just stop it at tetrahedral. We don't really get more complicated than tetrahedral. Maybe if sulfurs are around, but I don't play with sulfurs very much. So that's nice. Um, but we have to be able to show sort of this idea that this molecule isn't flat. Sometimes we have to be able to show that. And so what we do is we imagine that we're drawing it on a piece of paper and the one that's pointing straight up and straight to your right, my left, is in the plane of the page. And then to represent that that green's coming towards you, I'm gonna do like a fat wedge towards you. And to represent that the white's going away from you, I'll do a dash. So I'm gonna draw this on the visualizer to show you what I mean. So this is the molecule we have. And if you just hold it like this, you know, you can't actually even see this hydrogen very well behind it. So we, I imagine we kind of tilt it lightly like this maybe, so we can see both of them. This is a hydrogen going straight up and this, uh, we'll pretend there's three hydrogens around this carbon right here, CH3 there. And then the green molecules coming towards us. So that's the chlorine. And the hydrogen back there is going away. So now I've drawn a tetrahedral molecule for you. Um, usually that hydrogen is kind of pointing down a little bit more. It's hard to do both uh, to hold all these things and draw, but it kind of can be more like this, where it's pointing down. And sometimes people, to do the dimension, will even draw it like this. But usually uh, where it's fat at the beginning and small at the end, but usually in organic chemistry textbooks, you'll see it like this. That's kind of the most often you'll see. So that's what we mean when we say there's the CH3 is, uh, I'll do it this way for you. The CH3 is in the plane of the page and the hydrogen is in the plane of the page because if we're drawing it on a plane, on a page, this is our plane right here. And the thing that's coming toward you is the wedge and or is the fat, solid line and the thing that's going into the page is the dashed line. So we won't do a ton of drawing with 3D molecules right now. Um, I just wanted you to know that they exist. And I wanted you um, to know like when I say sometimes hydrogen are drawn into bond line formula because 3D structure needs to be shown, that's literally what I mean. So here are some examples of how it can be drawn in. And here, this is estradiol. This is a hormone that's often used in birth control. And as you can see, there are some wedges and some dashes. No hydrogens are drawn in except the ones that need to for 3D structure. So whenever you see those wedges and dashes, that's what's going on. That's why those are there, is because we need to know which direction that's pointing. And we will talk a lot more about that in chapter four and five, but I don't want you to kind of freak out about um, like, oh, I need to know when to draw the wedge and the dash. That's not going to be on your upcoming quiz. You just need to know that that exists and we're going to dig into it more. And you need to know why there are sometimes wedges and dashes for now. And for those of you who are going to be doctors, you know, this, the things you're doing actually play into medicine. I take this medicine, right? This is real. This is something in real life that you're learning about right now. It's kind of cool. Okay, so let's talk about how bonds are made and what they are. So again, going back to Gen Chem, there are S orbitals and there's P orbitals. There's S orbitals um, as usually they're drawn as a sphere. Really what that more means is like, this is roughly where the electrons hang out in this spherical shape. And then the P orbitals are roughly where the electrons hang out in this, they call it a dumbbell shape. Um, so they're just areas where electrons would be likely to be found. Literally, they came up these shapes with mathematical equations. If you are a chemistry major, is there any chemistry majors in here? Nice, what up, my man. Okay, there was only like seven in my graduating class. Um, so you will get to go to PCHEM and PCHEM 2, and you'll get to see them do the math equations for how they found out where these orbitals are. I was terrible at PCHEM, but it was really cool to be like, oh, that's why orbitals are shaped that way. Like, I just saw the math 
and like plug that equation in and it really did make that shape. That's amazing. So that's pretty cool, but it's not worth it if you're not a chemistry major to sit through that class just for that experience. Um, so these areas will overlap to make bonds, like the shared electrons between the overlap of two orbitals, that's what a bond is. So if you have two hydrogen atoms that have bonded together, those S orbitals overlap, and that's a bond. But some orbitals have lower energy than others. S orbitals have lower energy, meaning they're more stable. We think of low energy as a bad thing, like, oh, they're very low energy. They must be depressed. Now, low energy is more stable in scientific terms. Um, and so if an atom is making four bonds like carbon tends to do, it can't really use 1s and 3p orbitals to make those four bonds. So I'm gonna switch to the visualizer and show you what I mean. Because I need to draw things. So if you imagine a carbon atom, and let's say it's trying to make four bonds because four bonds give it a full octet, and um, there's a 1s orbital that's full and nobody cares about that. And then we go to our 2s orbital and our 2p orbital, and these are our valence electrons, right? And normally you probably learn to fill from the bottom up, but if you're trying to make bonds, each orbital only needs one electron because it's overlapping with another electron. So it doesn't need two electrons in each orbital. So let's put one electron in each orbital. So if all these bonds existed, it would be weird because the S orbital, let's say it's bonding with hydrogen, I have a different color pin. It's bonding with hydrogen and that hydrogen fills in here. So this bond maybe wouldn't be too weird because it'd be two S's overlapping, but that bond is gonna be a lot more stable than if you just used um, three P bonds to make these other ones, right? You would have a molecule that's like, has one hydrogen really close and then one hydrogen really far away <laughs> and another hydrogen really far away. And then this one goes into and out of the page. So this is the fat wedge and this is the dash. And then another hydrogen really far away. That's a weird shaped molecule. Nature does not like to be a weird shaped. One bond of those is gonna be really stable and the other ones are not. So when a carbon atom is trying to bond, Something happens that you've definitely heard of before called hybridization. And that's why hybridization happens is so that all of those bonds can be equal, stable, and there can be a nice symmetrical shape or a nice, everyone gets the same space all around their electrons shape. And that's where hybrid orbitals come in. So if you have your 2s and 2p, and you're trying to make four bonds, these will combine to make three, uh, S, sorry, four sp3 orbitals. So you took three p's, one s, and you combined all of those together. You like blended them up in a blender and then evenly spread them out between all of the orbitals. And that's a hybrid orbital called sp3. So those are able to be arranged around the carbon atom in your tetrahedral shape. There's one sp3 orbital. They kind of have like a little tiny lobe on the other side. That doesn't matter too much. One that goes up, one that goes down, one that goes, we'll draw it on the side, into the plane of the page, and one that comes out of the plane of the page. Trying to make that look 3D. I did a bad drawing on this, but that makes a tetrahedral shape. So instead of having three P's and one S that are going to bond in a lopsided way, we get four sp3 hybrid orbitals that can all bond evenly. And that's why, literally, that hybridization is why we have sp3, or is why we have tetrahedral bonds. Because if you think about that bonding is orbitals overlapping, and then that P orbitals are just in the X, Y, and Z plane, it doesn't really make sense that tetrahedral shapes exist. And we know that tetrahedral shapes exist, so that must be where hybridization comes in. Okay, so if something is sp3 hybridized, that means it has three bonds. Do you remember the difference between sigma and pi bonds? No? Okay, I've got a good trick for you. Sigma bonds is if there's just like one single bond to an atom. So sigma kind of sounds like single. But if you have, let's get rid of um, this thing. If you have a pi bond, I like to say that people who are good at making pies 
um, have more friends. So pi bonds are multiple because if you have pi, people want to hang out. So if something has um, more than one bond, one of those bonds is a sigma and the other bond is a pi. So here we have that case where there's, here's a sigma bond, here's a sigma bond, here's a sigma bond, but that other bond, this is what we call a pi bond. And pi bonds are made up of overlap of p orbitals. Pi p. So while this is sp3 hybrid, if one of your p orbitals, if one of your p orbitals is engaging in double bonding, then you only hybridize the rest of these, and you make three sp2. So in this case, you have three sp2 hybrid orbitals making sigma bonds. And then right here, this extra pi bond is made from the overlap of those orbitals. Can you kind of see that? Like this is the this is the dumbbell shape of the one half of the p. So these p orbitals overlapping make your pi bond. And this gets into an easy way to tell the hybridization is if you can just count up sigma bonds, then you know how many hybrid orbitals you have. And then you can tell, oh, I have three sigma bonds. That must be sp2 hybridized because there's one s, two p's. So, um, and that is, what's that shape of an sp2 hybrid carbon? Trigonal planar, triagonal planar, however you want to say it. I don't know if I spelled that right, but yes. So the only shapes you need to know really in this class are tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and um, linear. You also need to know that if you replace one of your bonds with a lone pair, it'll do the pyramid or the bent shape, but mostly these are the ones you're worried about. Okay, now if we um, take another bond away, another sigma bond away and we replace it with a pi bond. There's that. Now we're using, I don't know why I was holding this up. This is way better. Um, now we're using our S orbital, but two of our P orbitals are taken up in this pi bond and this pi bond, right? So we only have one S orbital and one P orbital. So the hybrid orbitals that make up our sigma bonds are gonna be SP and there's two of those. So these two bonds around the carbon, let's say I just picked one of them randomly. These are the sigma bonds. There's two, so we need two orbitals. So it must be SP. And then these two are pi bonds. So you have two pi bonds, one sigma bond. Um, what's the shape of this? Linear, that's right. So sometimes when we're drawing in our condensed formula, we like to represent the tetrahedral shape. If there's a triple bond, we don't do the bend there because triple bonds are not bent. So triple bonds won't have a bend and you just have to know that there's a carbon right where that triple bond starts. Okay. So um, one thing to note is when you average these together, I'm gonna redraw all these actually where you can see it at one time. If you have, I'm gonna draw three of them. Say uh, this is where your P orbitals are and this is where your S orbitals are. If you have three P and one S, the average of that is gonna be a little bit higher in energy. So these sp3 orbitals are on the higher energy side where this is lower energy. If you only have 2p and 1s, you've got a higher percentage of s, so it becomes a little bit more stable. So sp2 orbitals are a little bit more stable. And then if you have 50-50 s and p, those are maybe a little bit higher than that, but even closer to the s level, 
So that's why, as you've probably heard, that triple bonds are more stable than double bonds, et cetera, et cetera. It's because there's a higher S character in the hybridization. There's a higher percentage of that S. Okay, so that's hybridization. That's a theory behind why hybridization happens. I want you to know that because I think it's important for you to know that, but you don't have to go through all of that on your exams or your quizzes. All you have to do, it's amazing, is count up the number of sigma bonds. So I'm gonna draw in the hydrogens for you here to make it a little bit easier. Here we have this structure. How many sigma bonds are around this carbon right here? Four. I saw a few people hold up their hands. A few people heard, said that. So there's, you need at least one S and you need three P orbitals. So that must be sp 3 hybridized. Boom. That's it. You just got to count up the sigma bonds. What about this carbon? How many sigma bonds are around it? Three sigma bonds. One right here, one right here, one right here. So it must be sp2 hybridized. I'm just randomly assigning spp because it helps me to visualize it. There must be three bonds. We must have three orbitals. So it's a hybrid of sp and p. Or this one, they're hybrid of sp3. So I just kind of do that to count. I just, that's just random. So really all these are sp3. So maybe a better way you could do it is count up. There's one, two, three, four sigma bonds. So you must need one, two, three, four orbitals. So it's sp3. Or in this one, each one of these is actually sp2, but there's, there's one, two, three orbitals. So you must need one, two, three hybrid orbitals. So it's sp2. What about this one? How many sigma bonds are here? Two. You don't have to be afraid to be wrong. There's one here, one here. So it must be one, two. So this is sp hybridized. So that's all you have to do to figure out the hybridization of a molecule is count up the sigma bonds and then figure out how many hybrid orbitals it might need. Yes. Yep, this is made up of the overlap of the p orbitals that weren't used here. So when you have this sp hybrid, you still have two p orbitals up here. So this bond up top, this drawing is terrible, but this bond up top would sort of be the overlap of those two p orbitals. And then you have another overlap of two p orbitals down below. And that's how you get your triple bond. So one of these is made up of a hybrid bond overlap, and these two are made up of p orbital overlaps. Make sense? Mm-hmm. This one right here? This is sp2 because there's one, two, three sigma bonds. So there must be one, two, three orbitals. So three orbitals is sp2. So it helps me to actually write out, instead of counting up one, two, three, because then I'm thinking three, and then I'm likely to write sp3, which is wrong. That's why I'll sometimes just be like SPP. Okay, that's an SP2 hybrid. So some that's why I drew it out that way. I realized though that it could be confusing because you're thinking, wait, is one of those an S and one of those a P? It's not. They're all hybrid orbitals. But if I say the number three, then I start to think it's SP3 because I said the number three, even though it's SP2. So I get myself mixed up. So usually I just say like, oh, if there's three things, SPP must be sp2 hybridized. Yes. Um, so it's like triple bonds. Mm -hmm. Nope, it's just, that's a good question. It's just two carbons. Wait. Oh, in this whole thing? Let me count. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, six. That's a good question. Yeah, uh, I saw your hand up. First. Well, this one right here, each of these carbons is sp because there's one, it might be easier to see on here because I haven't drawn over it. There's one sigma bond on each side. 
So each of those like needs an orbital. So you get a hybrid orbital with sp that have two hybrid orbitals. And then these other two are made up of the overlap of p orbitals. Yes. That's if you're doing nomenclature stuff. So I will always tell you which molecule I want you to tell me the hybridization of. So like you'll see on your recitation packets today, it'll be like, what's the hybridization of this molecule, the central atom, uh, the carbon in each one of these. You'll know what one I want you to look at. Okay. I think with hybridization, you will, wait, are there any more questions? I think if you can practice it a few times, you'll realize like, oh, I got this. I just have to count up the number of sigma bonds. It's confusing when other people do it, but if you practice it and you get it down a few times, you'll be quick. Okay. So some orbitals have lower energy than others. If one atom is making four bonds, it doesn't want to be lopsided, so it will hybridize to even that out. Oh, I didn't animate this slide. So atomic orbitals are around a specific atom, right? You have your carbon atom that has S and P when it's all by itself. But when it's in bonding, those atomic orbitals overlap with each other. We call the overlapping orbitals molecular orbitals. So if an sp3 hybrid orbital overlaps with another one to make a bond between two carbons, that would be a molecular orbital. So that's just kind of a name. You don't have to worry a ton about knowing that. Molecular orbitals are going to be more stable, though, and lower in energy than atomic orbitals. That's why bonds form. It's because when those overlap, there's, there's more stability for the electrons to be there, so they want that stability. Um, sigma bond is the first single bond that happens, and all the bonds after that, the multiples, those are pi bonds, and they're made up of the overlap of p orbitals. I should have showed you this warning before we did the visualization. I said warning, it's about to get heavy. I should have told you that before, trigger warning. Um, so yeah, that's what we were just doing. I, it, if it feels heavy and you're like, I'm having a hard time visualizing this overlap. Yeah, that's because you're not used to visualizing the way molecules hang out and you shrink down to the tiny size of a molecule and like try to visualize what it looks like. That's not normal for you. So when you try to do new things, you're usually gonna be a little uncomfortable in the beginning. So if you're feeling a little uncomfortable and you're like, I don't think I quite have this. That's okay. That's totally normal. I just wanted to introduce you to the idea of how bonding occurs. And I wanted you to have an idea of the overlap of those molecular orbitals so that you knew why hybridization occurred. But if you're like kind of freaking out and you're like, I don't know if I could recreate this, I'm never going to ask you to draw a hybrid orbital. I will only ever ask you to tell me what the hybridization of the atom is. So don't freak out. Um, and then I just want you to connect that with Vesper theory and the shapes of organic molecules. I want you to know there's a reason why we draw things the way we do and that things look the way they do in organic chemistry. But it's okay if you're confused, you're doing something totally new. The first time I ever ice skated, somebody had to hold my hand as an adult. I was like 28. They were holding my hand and taking me on the ice. And I was like, this is a mistake. I'm so bad at this. And then they gave me a stack of buckets to hold on to while I was skating because I didn't know how to skate. That was uncomfortable. I felt stupid. I was not stupid. I was just new. So that's kind of what you're doing right now too. So sp3 hybridized. Um, this is with the line bond structure. It has four sigma bonds around it. Those bonds have to be in equal orbitals. So instead of using 3s and or 3p and 1s, we have the overlap of four sp3 hybrid orbitals. What orbital do you think is around the hydrogen? I heard someone say it. Say it louder. Say it proud. Sigma is the bond it makes. That's right. What do you say? It's an S orbital because hydrogens only have an S orbital, right? So the bond between a carbon and a hydrogen is the overlap of the sp3 hybrid orbital with the s orbital from the hydrogen, and that makes a bond. If it's between two carbons, that's the overlap of two hybrid orbitals usually. So covalent bonds are made up of the overlap of the sp3 hybridized carbon with the s orbital of the hydrogen. 
And this is just to kind of show you, these are the only shapes you'll need to know in all of organic chemistry. So you only need to know the base shape of linear, trigonal, planar, and tetrahedral. And then you'll need to know what happens when you replace those with electrons. So, um, and we, I won't like quiz you on this. This is just like when you're drawing water, you'll want to know why we draw water bent with two lone pairs on top. This is literally why is we draw things the way that their Vesper theory show. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's helpful for you to know that it goes into tetrahedral because 109.5 is larger than 90. So if it was 90 degree, like if, if it wasn't tetrahedral, if it was just like a square, what would this be, square planar? They're only getting 90 degrees between them. So that's not very good. But tetrahedral, if you like hold it up and literally compare, you can see how many more degrees. Oh, wait, I can do it here. No, I can't yet. Um, you can see how many more degrees are there between those two bonds. Like this one's lined up, but there's some space here. You're getting more space between each pair of electrons or each bond. And electrons don't like to be near each other. It's like when you push magnets near each other. So the 109.5 exists because it's like a better more comfy shape. Everybody gets space to move around. You should know that, but I am never going to be like, what's this bond angle? Because I don't care about that. I mean, I don't care about testing that much. So this is kind of the, um, this shows you the, what the sp3 hybrid orbitals look like in a better way than I could. Um, there's the, there's always a positive and a negative side to orbitals. The part that overlaps with other things is known as the bonding orbital. The other side is antibonding. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what antibonding orbitals was, and it was a waste of my time until I got to grad school. You will never have to talk about antibonding orbitals. I was like, why isn't anyone talking about this? I'm so confused. What do I need to know about this? Nothing. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> Just free yourself from worrying about that. It was not helpful until I got into PCHEM 2, I think, and the only person who's going to do that is the one chemistry major in this room. So don't worry about it. Um, and then this shows you the overlap of those sp3 hybrid orbitals in the carbon with the s orbital in the hydrogen. So you can actually see, this is a much better drawing than I did on my scribbles. But I like to introduce you here and then bring you back here so that we kind of get two passes at it. Now sp2, it's 120. There's one sigma bond and one pi bond. And we'll actually, you can see the overlap of these as well. The, uh, what's the sp3? Yes, okay, that's the sp3 carbon. This one down here is sp2. So they're showing you the difference. That's annoying. I want it to just be an sp2. Oh, well. Um, and then this is kind of showing you what the pi bond orbital overlap looks like. It also has that low, like there's the positive side and the negative side. The negative, the bottom side is the antibonding orbital. So I don't usually draw that when I'm showing my students how they overlap. You don't need to worry about that. So this part right here is what I usually draw because this makes it look like a triple bond, but it's showing you this is the bonding orbital and this is the antibonding orbital, but you don't need the antibonding orbital, so don't worry about it. But that's two P orbitals overlapping, one side bonding, one side antibonding. You will barely ever have to think about antibonding, don't worry about it. Okay, so this is uh, just showing you this red and blue one is the P orbital, and then this flat one, so the P orbital is going up and down, right? And then the flat one is the sp2 hybrid orbital. So we're introducing you this now so you can visualize these. It doesn't come up a ton except in the shape of molecules and stuff. But then when we get into OCHEM2, there's all kinds of stuff about resonance structures and aromatic rings. And it's beautiful. And being able to visualize this will really, really help you out. So I'm just giving you the foundation the first introduction. OK, and then this is another example of the pi bond, the overlap. So here's your sigma bond overlap between two sp2 hybrid orbitals on two carbons. Then you have an sp2 overlap with a hydrogen uh, s orbital. And then this is your, this is one double bond. This is the bonding orbital. This is the antibonding orbital. Don't worry about the antibonding orbital. Don't worry about the antibonding orbital. Not important. Okay, and then a trip, a carbon carbon triple bond is has uh, that's an sp2 hybridized carbon. That's wrong. I hate these freaking slides. Um, sp hybridized carbon, not sp2. Um, so you can see the sp orbital is just linear, 
And then there's two overlaps of two pi bonds. So that's where you get the this structure, right? So your linear bond is kind of in the middle, and then you have your two p orbital overlap. So this molecule representation obviously isn't perfect, but um, this is just giving you another way to visualize that. So because sp is 50% s and 50% p, it's a little bit more stable. sp2, 33% s, 67% p. sp3, 25, 75. So that's what I drew like. sp3, slightly less stable. Um, or I guess it's slightly more stable than P orbitals. SP2 is even more stable than that. SP is even more stable than that. And then the most stable orbital is the S orbital. Lower in energy equals more stable. Um, and then this sort of because of that same thing, the bond length of the SP orbitals, the SP uh, hybridized carbons are shorter. So the carbon-carbon triple bond will be shorter here. Then the carbon carbon double bond and the carbon carbon single bond is longest. Because the greater the s orbital, the more stable it is. The bond is shorter, it's more spherical. So it's kind of like an average between the two. It's closer to the nucleus, it's overall stronger. So it's closer together. So you talked about bond lengths of single, double, and triple bonds when you were in Gen Chem. And what I like about OCHEM is in that case, we just told you it was like that. And now we're telling you literally why. At the orbital level, now you know why triple bonds are stronger and shorter than single bonds. So we go, I love OCHEM because you get to zoom in on the individual atoms and molecules, their electrons, and you get to talk more about why they do what they do than just what they do. And these are just example of hybrid orbitals if you want time visualizing them. So like you can see uh, the overlap of fluorine with uh, boron or yeah, different things. I won't spend too much time on that. And then this is again shapes of the different hybrid orbitals. Um, what time is it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this practice problem break so that we have time for you to do them in recitation, but it'll just be assigning Hybrid, uh, hybridization. And I think that comes pretty easily to students because you don't have to visualize the orbitals every time. You just have to say if it's sp3, sp2, sp1. Okay, different compounds of the same molecular formula um, are known as isomers. So they'll have the same number of each atom, but they can have different arrangements and different properties. So C4H10 could either be a straight line of carbons or it could be a branch chain of carbons. Those both have four carbons. So let's practice our bond line formula. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. They both have four carbons and they both have 10 hydrogens. Three hydrogens here, two, two, three. So that's five, seven, 10. And then over here you have three, three, three. So that's nine plus one in the middle. So they are the same number of carbons and hydrogens but they're constructed differently. So these are isomers and they can have different properties. So when they're constructed differently like that, that's called constitutional isomers. So they're the same atoms, but they're, they're bonded together totally differently. Like the condensed formula of ethanol is CH3CH2OH. The condensed formula of methoxymethane is CH3OCH3. So they have totally different condensed formulas they have totally different properties. They're arranged totally differently. They're constructed differently. So we call those constitutional isomers. They're constitutionally different. But some types of isomers don't have different condensed formulas. And um, that gets into cis trans isomers and something called stereo isomers. So I'm just going to draw this structure. Now, do you remember the idea that double bonds can't rotate? Sort of, some of you are nodding. I'll, I'll just do a quick show. So if we have a single bond, just one sigma bond, this can easily rotate and that bond doesn't break and it's delightful, right? Great. So these can take all kinds of different arrangements. But if you have your triple bond, if I try to rotate this, those bonds would break. Or even if you have your double bond, if I tried to rotate this, 
those bonds would break. So single bonds um, are able to rotate, but double bonds are not able to rotate. So I'm gonna draw this not out. Okay. Nothing with carbon atom. So it's like six, but I only have four. Oh, there they are. Okay. Oh, that would have been handy. <clears throat> so this is this. It can't rotate. Right? So to be able to turn this into this, we physically have to break those bonds and do this. Have you guys ever heard of cis trans isomers before? Oh, great. I don't remember what gets taught in Gen Chem, I guess. So what I like to say is these have the same cons uh, the same condensed formula. So you have to specify that something's different. And that's cis trans isomers. So um, the condensed formula for both of these would be CH3, CH, CH, CH3, right? Both of those that accurately describes the condensed formula. So you have to say either cis or trans to tell the difference. And that is um, cis trans isomers. That's what they are. They do have different properties between different isomers. Um, but they're part of a class of isomers called stereoisomers. And all stereoisomers have the same condensed formula. They're just arranged differently in space. So stereoisomers is like um, the 3D arrangement in space is different, whereas constitutional isomers, they're literally constructed differently. Okay, and um, very common to our everyday language, trans, opposite side, cis, same side. So here are a few examples, trans 3-hexene and cis 3-hexene. We haven't gotten to the nomenclature yet, but much like the condensed formula, the official chemistry nomenclature for both of these is exactly the same, and you just have to specify if it's cis or trans. So that's just a few examples of those. And now let's get into curved arrows. So curved arrows show the direction of electron flow. They are one of my favorite, absolute favorite things in organic chemistry. They go from areas of more dense electrons to less dense electrons. And they show the movement of electrons only, never atoms. And they exist so that we can speak in our communal language of organic chemistry. This one doesn't do something. Yeah. It might be because it's animated. She might have to download it. Yeah. Stereoisomers. Because they have the same condensed formula and the same name but you have to specify their three D arrangement. And constitutional isomers would have different names and different condensed formulas. That was a good question. Good question. Um, okay, so curved arrows. What we're doing? Very good. Curved arrows, all about the movement of electrons. Um, so for those of you who are in my office today, we kind of talked about this once already. But if you are an organic chemist and you're trying to communicate like, oh, this is how a bond forms, this is how a bond breaks, but you um, are doing it in a peer-reviewed journal article that's being published or in a textbook that's being published and you can't literally explain it, we have to have a universal language to show movement. It is very much like in sports when if you've ever played football or, or hockey or whatever, and they'll show you the play with like circles and X's and the arrows move and they're showing you the movement. That's what we're doing. We're showing you the play of the electrons. And organic chemistry is all about how and why bonds form the way that they do. And so we need to be able to talk about how and why the electrons are moving the way that they are. So in this case, if your bond broke, 
both of these electrons, I'm going to sort of draw the dots to represent the electrons, are going to move to one side. So that's what I what, what the arrow I've drawn shows that. So this hydrogen has no electrons. So what's the formal charge of this hydrogen? If you're in office hours, don't answer. Which the, well, let me draw this. You're right about this one being a hydride, but how did you calculate it? How do you calculate formal charge? You don't have to answer anyone's the answer, except my office hour people. How do you calculate formal charge? Valence electrons minus bonds minus electrons or minus dots minus lines. Um, there's nothing here, right? So it starts out with one. There's no bonds. There's no electrons. So what does that equal? And now you know why we have protons. That's why protons are positively charged because of formal charge. Now this one on the right, what would be the formal charge on that? What'd you say? The not quite. There's two electrons. I love that you said it with confidence though. That's what I want to see. It starts with one valence electron minus two electrons there equals negative one. Never be afraid of being wrong in my class. Be afraid of not understanding it. Okay. That's more important than being wrong. Because if you're wrong in class, you'll never be wrong again. <laughs> you're like, ah, crap. I messed that up in front of everybody. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> so never be afraid of that. Okay. So we showed that these electrons moved to this side, that bond broke, and now we have a hydride, which is a negatively charged hydrogen atom, and a proton, which is a positively charged hydrogen atom. So literally, this arrow showed the movement of these electrons towards one side. Now, if these were going to recombine, I would show this by drawing these electrons attacking that hydrogen atom. And you always go from the area of electrons to the area without electrons. And the way I like, you know, kind of try to stick that in my students' mind is positive people don't attack you on the street. Somebody who's got positive vibes and they're just living their life, they're not going to come at you. But somebody who's got negative vibes that's like angry, they like to give that to other people. They're like, I'm mad. I'm like coming at you. So, you know, that's what happens in atoms too. The area with more electron density, it doesn't have to always be negative, but electrons are negative inherently, whether or not there's a negative formal charge or not. The area with the electrons is going to be the thing where the arrow starts. So right here, this wasn't negatively charged, but we start at the bond because that's where the electrons are, and it moves towards the hydrogen. Here, this is negatively charged. The electrons are here. They're moving towards this hydrogen, so this bond is forming. So curved arrows exist to make and break bonds. That's what they show how bonds are made and how bonds are broken. They usually go from being a lone pair to being a bond or from being a bond to being a lone pair. Now, you'll notice that my arrows have two little things. That's normal for arrows. They're called barbs. That actually represents two electrons. You've seen single barbed arrows represent one electron before in orbitals. So if I want to show that this bond is breaking unevenly, I'll give one barb to each side. And that's how we show radicals are formed, or we show the movement of one electron. So the, the number of barbs corresponds to the number of electrons that are moving. So here, we know that both of those electrons are moving to this hydrogen because there's two barbs. Here, we know that each hydrogen gets one electron because there's one barb. If this was drawn, that would be incorrect. There would have to be three electrons here to make this work. So don't, don't do that. Okay, and that comes into play a lot with resonance. So um, the flow of electrons, it goes from the electron dense area to the carbon area. It's only showing the movement of electrons, bonds making or bonds breaking, not atoms moving. So here's an example. Each of these um, individual atoms, 
or what? Each of these individual electrons have a single barb. They come together to make a covalent bond. So we're showing that bond being formed with the movement of electrons through arrows. So if they cleave unequally, that's called hetero, hetero, I never say this word, heterolysis. Heterolytic, I do say, bond cleavage means that one atom is going to get both electrons. One atom is not going to have any. So that usually makes ions. If they cleave homolytically, homolysis, they go, each side gets the same thing. So then they make radicals. So basically, just what I showed you. So notice this has the double barbed arrow and this has single barbed arrow. Okay, again, I think I'm going to hold off on practice problems so that we have time for recitation. Um, let's talk about resonance. So you guys have learned about resonance before, correct? A little bit in Gen Chem, probably. Okay, we go deeper into resonance in OK. The idea behind resonance is um, in this movie, is this Marvel? I never know. In this Marvel movie, you have Bruce Banner, right? And the Hulk. Okay, great. And they kind of interconvert, right? So at the beginning, Bruce Banner and the Hulk are two separate beings in a way. But at the end, they become Professor Hulk, Dr. Hulk, right? That's resonance theory. We have no way of drawing a hybrid molecule. So we draw two separate molecules that actually neither one of them is an exact representation. The hybrid of the two is more accurate. So we draw Bruce Banner and the Hulk, but what we really mean is Professor Professor Hulk that has elements of both. And that's what resonance theory is. So like if you have, uh, this is benzene, this is classic, you'll see this a ton. Um, it's also very carcinogenic. Did you recently hear about it being in sunscreen? That was a huge deal. That was a huge deal. Benzene is known to be carcinogenic and these chemical companies were not realizing that some of the chemicals they put in their sunscreens broke down into benzene over time. So it's so banned that they never even were testing for it because nobody uses it because it's banned. And then some guy at a analytical lab, somebody added it to his list of things to check for. And he was like, this is a waste of time. And there was benzene in so many different sunscreens and that causes cancer. So that's bad. It's okay if there's benzene rings with things on it, but if it's just a benzene ring by itself, not good. So go look at the list of recalled ones and don't use those. But do use sunscreen every day because then you'll get cancer from the sun. No matter your skin tone, you have to wear sunscreen every day. Okay. So um, benzene has often it's drawn as representing alternating double bonds. But if you draw these curved arrows and the bonds sort of switch positions, it gives you a different set of alternating double bonds. <clears throat> What's actually happening when we've tested the bond length of uh, benzene rings in real life, like in experimental settings, is none of these are double bonds and single bonds. They're all one and a half length bonds. So it's a perfect average of these two. If there's more than two structures and one's more stable than the other, it's not always a 50-50 mixture of the two. Maybe it'll be like 75% of the more stable one, 25% of the less stable one. So in organic chemistry, though, we don't just have to know about resonance. We also have to draw the different resonance structures. So resonance structures differ, differ only in the positions of electrons. The molecular, uh, the molecular, the ion are better represented by a hybrid that we can't show. So we show Bruce Banner, we show the Hulk, but it's actually Professor Hulk. And this is a good example, the carboxylate ion. So um, you could have the negative being shown as just being on one oxygen or just being on the other oxygen. But in reality, each of those oxygens have about half of a negative charge on them. So the negative charge is spread out. And that actually makes it more stable. Like if you think about if you're having a really bad day and you're dealing with that all by yourself and then you come home and you can share it with someone else, that takes a little bit of the weight off of you, right? So the same thing with the carboxylate ion. Instead of each oxygen carrying its weight completely by itself, it's sharing that weight through resonance with the other oxygen. So both oxygens are a little negative, but the overall molecule is more stable because of that resonance. And then ozone has the same three thing. Ozone is three oxygen molecules, and you can draw it where there's like a positive and a negative, positive and a negative, but actually the, the double bond is spread out between the two. 
So um, only the positions of the electrons and the actual molecular ion is better represented by a hybrid. All of the structures should be proper Lewis structures. You might have one without a full octet, but that's going to contribute a lot less to the overall average. It's like your homework grades only 15%, your exam grades 35. You know, if there's a not full octet, it's going to be a lower percentage of the overall hybrid molecule. So this isn't right because something has exceeded the octet. So you cannot have a full octet, but you can't have too much of an octet. So this oxygen has two, four, six, wait, no, it's not the oxygen. Oh, is this carbon? Two, four, six, eight, ten. So that is not a proper Lewis structure because carbon cannot have 10 bonds. It can have not enough bonds, but it can't have too many. There's no orbitals for those to exist in. So that's not possible. The overall hybrid will be more stable than the individual Lewis structures. So like here are our three. Um, this is I think carboxylic acid without its hydrogens. So these are our three different resonance. Each of these are less stable because the negative charge is fully on one. But when you combine them all together, the charge gets to spread out. Carbonic acid is what's in our sodas that make it bubbly because it will break down into water and carbon dioxide. So it's kind of an equilibrium in our soda cans between CO2, carbonic acid, CO2, carbonic acid, and then you open it and it goes pssst. And then Le Chatelier's principle comes to effect and your gas is escaping and so you're making more gas until there's no carbonic acid. Science, chemistry for your life. Okay, um, the overall hybrid is always going to be more stable than the individual Lewis structures. And then in this class, the thing that you haven't done before, I don't think, is use curved arrows to show the movement of electrons. So for example, we've always seen before, these are two resonance structures of the same thing, but you now know that you can show that this bond breaks and becomes a lone pair, and that's how we get this resonance structure. So you have to use curved arrows to show. Double-headed arrows are going to be uh, de demonstrate well, I'll just let this one. Those double-headed arrows demonstrate resonance structures. The equilibrium arrows are different. So resonance structures are not in equilibrium with each other. They are the same thing. They are Professor Hall. They're not in equilibrium like he is at the beginning of the movie. They're one thing like he is at the end of the movie. So, and you can see in that picture, I did the double-headed arrow between those two to represent that in actuality, it's Professor Hall. So the double-headed arrow should always be between um, resonance structures. And then it's here too, as well. So the equilibrium arrow is not the same thing as the double-headed arrow. Um, so resonance structures aren't perfect averages. They're more like weighted averages. The most stable Lewis structure contributes the most. Um, more stable is if it has more covalent bonds than lone pairs. If there's charges, especially if they're separated, that's not good. So it'll be a lower contributor. Um, overall balance is more stable. So this has three bonds, so that's less stable. This is a higher resonance contributor. They actually come together to where there's a light partial positive right here and a light partial negative here. So it's not a perfectly even double bond. There's a little bit of polarity there due in part to electronegativity negativity, the oxygen is a little bit more electronegative. It's pulling that bond, the electron density towards itself, but also the resonance structure contributes to some of that disparity. Okay, I'm going to skip practice problems. This is reminders from yesterday that I didn't do. So you did the completion very helpfully already. If you haven't, I haven't graded it yet. So get in under the wire. Um, I want you to make a study plan for how to succeed now that you've seen a whole chapter. Um, watch the TikTok videos that I post. Um, I'll usually post at least some every class day. Do your chapter one homework, do it first, then watch the video to see. Um, I said make a study plan for how to succeed twice. And then I also want you to make friends and chat with people. Friends make organic chemistry so much better. Because sometimes one will understand things other people won't. And it's just like, oh, at least we have each other. Um, and we can kind of get through it together. If you have to miss class for any reason, you have a friend there that took notes and possibly asked questions. So you can ask them about it. And um, if you make study groups, it's accountability. 
So that's also helpful. So I highly recommend that you make friends and talk to each other. Okay. Um, let's get into chapter two because there's not a ton of it. And I think that we'll, I think we'll spend about 10 minutes on it. And I think we'll make good progress. And then we'll go into your, um, we'll go into your recitation. We'll take a short break and move into recitation. Okay. So one thing I want you to do now that we finish chapter one is go back through those PowerPoints. And I have that um, in your recitation as well, but you can leave that to do by yourself. Go back through those PowerPoints, make a majors ideas list. Here's everything we covered in this chapter. And that's your little study guide that you can use as you go back and forth, like on different practice problems that you can check and you don't have to go through all of the PowerPoints. You have the major ideas condensed into one thing and it'll help you understand the concepts and solidify that. And then you can use that as a study guide for your exam. Okay, we're gonna talk about functional groups and inter, uh, intermolecular forces. So functional groups are probably new, intermolecular forces are probably not. Um, functional, we're gonna talk about what they are, uh, and all of that. So we've already talked about hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons have only carbons and hydrogens. If there are no double bonds, those are called alkanes. A-N-E-S, that suffix is what matters, alkanes. So this is called pentane, this is called cyclohexane. You don't need to get into the actual nomenclature yet, but pay attention to that aim. Alkenes have a double bond. So if there's a double bond here, that ends in E-N-E. -E. Alkene double bond. Alkyne has a triple bond. Why they decided to make these so similar, I don't know. Couldn't they have called them singlies, doublies, and triplies? Sure. But instead they made ain, ene, and ein, which I don't think is fair, especially when we all come from different countries, have different languages, and different accents. But try to distinguish between ain, ene, and ein in your suffixes. And um, alkanes come from natural gas and petroleum. Smaller alkanes are um, gases at standard temperature and pressure. So like the smaller alkane chains are uh, gases in everyday life. Um, methane, for example, makes up natural gas and it makes up flatulence and it actually has no smell. They engineer methane to have a smell. So if there's a natural gas leak, um, we'll know it. So they actually put sulfur gases in with methane in natural gas lines. Um, and cows emit a lot of methane, and that actually is a greenhouse gas that contributes to the whole nose. Isn't that crazy? So that's part of why somebody said they're vegetarian, they care about the environment. That's like a way that being a vegetarian actually helps the environment is you're eating less cows, so less cows have to exist and put out all their greenhouse gases. Wild. Okay, alkene, um, ethene, so you have to have at least two carbons and propene, which has three, are the simplest. They are the backbone of producing ethanol, liquor, and um, polymers, um, and also acetone. So polymers, uh, we talked about how they're like one repeating unit that goes over and over to make a big molecule. Those are plastics. Polymers are plastic. And um, so this is polyethylene, E and E, Terephthalate, you don't need to worry about that. That's the other molecule, but it has that ethylene repeating over and over, and all these things come from that. If you ever get bored, I'll tell you, or you can listen to a podcast about how recycling plastic started as a scam from oil companies to make more money because plastics come from natural gases because they come from short hydrocarbons, and it's cheaper to make new plastic than recycle old plastic. So they started to make you believe it was okay to use single-use plastic so that people would buy single-use plastic so that they would make money. <sighs> Makes you so mad. Okay, alkynes um, in with Y and E. And some natural occurring alkynes are uh, capillin, which is an antifungal agent, or also a hormone used in birth control. I don't, this is not estrogen. Uh, I don't know what this is, but it is a hormone used in birth control. So you can see that triple bond right there. Um, aromatic compounds, we talked about like with benzene, they are rings with good stability. There will be a whole chapter on this in OCHEM 2. So benzene is a big carcinogen, but when it has extra groups on that, it's not dangerous. Um, it's just if benzene by itself and some derivatives of benzene are. 
And again, we talked about how that's got a resonance structure. So they're actually all in average between single and double bond length. Super stable because of resonance. And you'll see uh, later, I think I have some pictures of that. In the, oh, in the ketones. You'll see benzene as we go through it. Okay, so functional groups are atoms arranged in a specific way and have a specific reactivity. You'll see them a lot. They're beneficial to memorize. So I have a page where I'm like, memorize all these functional groups. This is one of the things I want you to memorize. I want you to understand how curved arrows work. I want you to memorize functional groups so it's quick and easy. I would make flashcards of these. When um, alkanes, you don't have to memorize these names yet. We'll get to these in chapter four. When alkanes are functional groups or act off of a main chain, they end in YL. I wouldn't worry about this too much, but sometimes groups of carbons are designated by R. So we'll come back to these ideas in a later chapter, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of alkanes as functional groups. So there are phenyl groups. So that's a benzene ring that's directly attached. A benzyl group that has a bend in it. So this is a functional group you need to know. If there's a halogen, so the R means a carbon chain, X means a halogen. Those are called alkyl halides. There's chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Okay, if you look at what this chlorine is attached to, this carbon right here, how many carbons is that attached to? This carbon right here. One. This is known as a primary alkyl halide. How many carbons is this attached to? Secondary alkyl halide. How many carbons is this attached to? Tertiary alkyl halide. So it shows up as, it looks like one degree, but you say primary, secondary, and tertiary. So you'll need to not only be able to identify alkyl halides, but you'll need to be able to say if they're primary, secondary, or tertiary. Um, alkyl halides are responsible for PVC pipes. They are also, um, when you make PVC pipes, they release HCl into the environment, which is terrible. They're also used in uh, cigarettes as a combustion agent. So that's why, that's part of why cigarettes are carcinogenic. So don't smoke. My dad smoked and it was really bad for his health. Um, alcohols and phenols, that's the OH group. You are very familiar with alcohols. Um, ethanol is what you drink. Isopropyl alcohol is what you put on cuts. Um, I don't know what we use this tertiary alcohol for, but you have to also know the same thing where it's, this is attached to one, so it's primary. This is attached to two, so it's secondary. This is attached to three, so it's tertiary. Um, phenol is chloroseptic that um, that numbs your throat and makes you feel good. Ethanol is what you drink. Isopropyl alcohol is what you rub on your um, cuts. I don't remember what this is. Should have reviewed. Um, ethers have two carbon chains with an oxygen between them. So here's an example of an ether that's not a, a ring, but they can also occur in rings. And they don't occur too, too much in nature, but uh, scientists have engineered these things called crown ethers, which will capture ions and they, because they have all these negative oxygens or all these like oxygen to extra electrons, so they can, they can capture positively charged ions and someone won the Nobel Prize for this because it has so many applications in medicine and this type of Amines, you've worked with these a lot in everyday life. There are nitrogens surrounded by hydrogens. You also need to know primary, secondary, tertiary for amines, but it's different for amines than halogens and alcohols. Instead of looking at what the amine is attached to, you look at how many carbons are attached to the amine. So there's one carbon attached to this nitrogen, primary. Two carbons attached here, secondary. Three carbons attached here, tertiary. So that's different than what we did before. And a lot of times people will get that mixed up. Um, pool smell is due to an amine and ammonium is also what you use to clean your windows. We have aldehydes and ketones. These are the focus of OCHEM2. You'll spend so much time in OCHEM2 looking at aldehydes and ketones. Remember there's that resonance structure with the partial positive right here. That makes that carbon center very reactive. So these are used a lot in reactions. Um, aldehydes have one hydrogen, ketones have two of the R groups, which are any carbon. You probably heard of formaldehyde that has two hydrogens, one on each side and no carbon chain. So this is a ketone, this is an aldehyde. Um, they're flat, trigonal planar. 
And so they can be easily attacked in addition to having that partial positive right there. So that's SP2 hybridized. So acetone, nail polish remover, that's a ketone. And this, this is an example of a good benzene ring that's substituted with an aldehyde. What's this group? What's this group? Ether, yeah. So this is vanilla. And artificial vanilla and actual vanilla are exactly the same in terms of this structure, which is called vanillin. The difference is artificial vanilla has no, um, it's less, it's actually very, very pure. It has no other flavor compounds. It's like just vanilla. Vanilla that's derived from plants has is very impure and has a lot of other flavor compounds that give it the depth of flavor. So actually artificial vanilla is pure and vanilla that comes from plants is impure, but that's why you like the way it tastes better. Isn't that crazy? Okay, um, I wanna get through these functional groups. We'll have carboxylic acids, esters, and amides. Um, all of these are uh, derivatives of carboxylic acids. There's a whole chapter where you learn about the reactivity of those as well in um, OCHEM 2. Uh, and then here are some examples. Carboxylic acid, the most simple one is vinegar that you use on salads and stuff. Benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid are also carboxylic acids. And then like Icy Hot has methyl salicylate in it. So you use these products in every day. What is fun to do after you've started to learn functional groups is read labels and see if you can find names you recognize. Um, and then there's nitriles. We probably see those less, but it's uh, less than other things, but it's worth it for you to know them. And those make like nitrile gloves or cyanoacrylate uh, super glue. Those are also, those are from that side. So these are the functional groups you need to know. Um, I won't talk about Sadly, so I'm going to have to change the last question on the quiz, but I won't talk about um, anything else on the quiz. I won't quiz you past this point, but you do need to know how to identify functional groups. And then also you need to know like how to see them on a molecule. So you have to be able to like identify them, know their names, all that for your quiz. So this is really just straight memorizing. We're going to switch to the recitation portion of class. So we have about 15 minutes. I want you to get in groups with people around you. I'm going to go get your recitation work so that you have some practice problems, and I will be back. Be in groups with the people around you, and come up here and um, grab a set of three cups. You get a <laughs> Everybody grab one recitation packet for everyone in your room, and then once it's turned in, that's going to be your participation grade for today. Groups of four. If you want to do less, you can, but try not to do more. Four packets for three people, five packets for four. There should be enough for everybody to do that. Are we allowed the note card or did we like a software? You are allowed to. That's a good question. I'll post. I'll probably post it on my social media if you want to know. Um, to give guidance on how to study for it. Okay, 
Okay, who's in y'all's group? Okay, so how this works is y'all just are going to go through this together. Each person gets to take one home with them, and then y'all all will turn one in with your names on it. And I'm going to assign you into groups and give you a group number. Hopefully, it gives them before class today, but if not, we can finish on Thursday. And that group number, you put it on your thing every single time, and it just makes it way faster for me to do this. Okay. And if you need help, if um, you want me to come stop and ask you questions, you or talk to you about your questions, you can put out the yellow cup. If you need like a lot of help, put out the red cup. But if you're doing fine and you want me to leave you alone, create a cup. Okay. What's your Thank you. 
Did I get all the groups? Okay. So I'm Y'all can keep working. Um, I'm going to remind you that you can use a note card tomorrow on your quiz. The quiz will be very similar to the one that I posted, but the last question I'm going to change uh, because we haven't covered that yet. I strongly encourage that you study, you make a bullet point of everything you learned from chapter one and then the functional groups from chapter two, and then do these practice problems and your chapter practice problems just as far as we've gotten in chapter two. And then look over that old quiz, questions one through three, and be prepared to do something similar. I'll see what the last question is I might warn you on that. And don't forget, you can bring a note card. Um, for whatever you want, but it has to be handwritten. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Thank you. 
So the positive is the absence of symptoms, so it says that it says there's no long So what is the length of symptoms? Don't worry about the hybridization of that. What does that say is doing there? It has to be changed. The carbon is four, so minus three, minus one. So how do you get from positive one to change? Excuse me, so how do you think you know this? Can I never use this? Okay, so you do the first one, minus one over the So carbon is four. And uh, we have a key off there, and we'll see three lines because the world is done. So, so that must be the second. Uh, long term, I'm here as of right now. You can just assume they're going to do the thing that makes them most stable with the carbon. But when we get into open two, sometimes they can do something different um, called the conjugation or the measure, or they'll move into a new order of the so you don't have to worry about that right now. So right now it's just here that they decide to do this. So will you dry that please? So if there's this is where formal charge is R. There's a negative charge here. So I can know about some of There's a negative charge here, so you have to assume that there is a negative charge. There's a long term to be a So I think it's positive to be a function of the yes. If there's a positive, that means why do you have So that's that, that formal charge. It's so easy when everything is drawn for you, students don't struggle with that. But then when there's a formal charge there and the things aren't drawn in, students are like, wait, I hope that. And you're like, in the light drawn. <laughs> so that's kind of the, that's the challenge. Um, I have a video already up with some of that, but I changed it up for y'all this semester, so um, I'll make it this one. Um, 
Is there any way that you can use that lower pair to make a difference? Whether or not it's like can you move a double bond or a little pair of the you could, but there's so many cards in the minutes that we do that. So, so they only go to two months of the time. Mm -hmm. So, draw the other one. Okay. 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 Okay.
So that is a very, very small relationship is a And what I want to come up with people are the value that are going to be able to do it. But if you, um, you know, the one of them, it's a problem. It's a problem. It's a
So I think you'll get it, but you just have to find love. So the way I start the workers is the column from the three. So I actually went over to the one worker. So it was mean if I could get it down. And I was like, I'm fine. So you want to go? Can't turn it over to the one. And then I say, are there any bonds? I think it's going to go under. Yeah, there's one. And then I do that same thing. So I made this one. No, but I do that probably five. So I said, there's another bond. It's still right there. That, and then so I do that is there's no other person that I thought about. And I have to get up a lot of it. I think it's going to do that kind of thing. So. And then for the kind of positive, that's like the last one for the last one. So I would try to do the same amount that I have to get the same thing as well. So those are the same as well. So for this, I want to do the positive thing. And I'm going to do the same thing as well. I just feel like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I just feel like it's the mind to like for this one has to be like on the other side. Okay, for all these guys, yeah, if they already, if they start with this positive, they're probably already positive. If you think they're all, that won't be positive. If it's negative or positive, that makes more positive than if you don't have to do the other one. But if it's neutral, you can actually make that work. This is the wrong thing. This is the wrong thing. This is the wrong thing. If that's positive, it's the wrong thing. Yeah. And so, like, you can't make anything a triple bond positive to a triple bond. You can make a triple bond. Um, if you hold this in the air, then oxygen carbon is strong, but the side bond is strong. Mm -hmm. You could break this bond and take on the oxygen, and it's still going to be there. So that's the one we have to take on the oxygen. So we can do that. Yeah. That's a good point. So I was wondering, like, even now, we can do it. But I will say um, this is this is organic growth and it's not the long term carbon. And I think the long term carbon is the same. So if I were to like this one, this is the same thing that we did here, and then we did the back here. On this one, you can go here, you can go here, you can triangle in, you can break out, you can go on the side, you can break out, or you can go back. Like there's so many, that, those guys are so much more annoying and surprising to me. But when you have like the organic muscle with the chain, it seems scarier at first. I know these people are like, ah, but they almost never live in the same So that's kind of one of the things that takes you You start to know your weak ground real well. And what you're allowed to do. And then you don't have to check for all those possibilities that you're going to start to um, okay, so like, <laughs> uh, there's no like long term, like, you can like If there's a long term, what can you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said, I'll okay, so <laughs> I'll you immediately. That's probably why I like these steps, is because people will be like, it's red, and then you get over there, and they answer the whole thing. You just ask them the question back, and I'm like, that was good. <laughs> and you knew more than you thought you did, and on a quiz or a test, you're like, red, 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 but actually, it's like, yellow. Yeah. I tell you, I have to Yeah, time taking, so it's taking a bit, and it's sort of good. Is use what you do know to try to read into the question, because a lot of times people will feel free about it. Is 
Okay. So if you're ever not sure, draw the thing you're trying to do and then see if it breaks in the middle. You can add them, you can have a little bit of a little offset. You know, it's like those are all the things you can do now. So you can check for it. I'm going to do a video of me solving those problems. There is already a video available of me doing some of them, but it's different because it's in the a different time of it's like a long semester. Oh, I was recording that whole time. 